Welcome to our April seminar as part of the Prevention Research Center for Healthy Neighborhoods seminar series. Today's seminar is co-sponsored by the Schubert Center for Child Studies. Today's seminar is an interdisciplinary presentation and team discussion on understanding the mental health needs of Latinx youth through lived experiences. Today's presentation discusses a project that was supported through a pilot grant awarded in 2019 by the Schubert Center for Child Studies in collaboration with the CWRU Office of Research and Technology Management. In addition to today's seed grant, the Schubert Center and CWRU Office of Research and Technology Management supported three additional projects. All are invited to join a lunchtime presentation tomorrow from 12 to 1 p.m. as Schubert faculty and research associates share initial findings from their timely work and answer questions in this informal conversation. There'll be a presentation discussing telehealth risk assessment and the identification of neurodevelopmental disabilities for high risk, low income groups. Another presentation will share an, an investigation of interventions to overcome domestic violence and build healthier families. And the third presentation will discuss models of follow up care for families of children with elevated blood levels. The registration link is in the chat or you can visit the Schubert Center website. Before we get started with today's presentation, just a few logistics and housekeeping for today's seminar. We recognize that in this format, you can't see who all is on the call. So if you could please use the chat feature to write down your name and organization to let others know who is here and joining the presentation. For questions, we ask that you please use the Q&A feature. Also, there is a raise your hand feature, which you can use during the question and answer period if you would like to request your microphone be unmuted. Also, I um, wanna highlight you can connect with the Prevention Research Center for Healthy Neighborhoods at our website or on social media. I'd like to welcome our speakers to today's seminar. Marisa Hollinshead is graduated from the University of Washington with a concentration in social justice and policy. She identifies as Mexican American and has experience working with children and families from diverse social, cultural, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Prior to, mo to moving to Cleveland, she worked in mental health, focusing on the developmental and biological underpinnings of mental health through neuroscience and psychiatric research. As she immersed herself in working with vulnerable populations, she decided to pursue her medical degree. Marisa moved to Cleveland to join the Northeastern Ohio Medical University, Cleveland State University Partnership for Urban Health Program. The partnership is geared toward training future physicians who are interested in serving marginalized populations. After graduation, Marisa plans to continue her research in identifying risk and protective factors for Latinx youth, adolescent youth in order to develop effective interventions for the patient population she sees. Nelson Ramirez served as the executive director for Hispanic Urban Minority Alcoholism and Drug Abuse Outreach Program from July 2015 through January 2021. Prior to this position, he served as, as its director of prevention. Prior to his joining Hispanic UMADOC, he served as regional manager for former state senator C.J. Prentice and the, and the governor's office for closing the Achievement Gap initiative, a statewide strategy to raise the graduation rate of African and Latino American male students. Also, he has served as executive director for El Centro de Servicios Sociales from 1990 to 1997 and Lorain County Community Action Agency from 2002 to 2006. His recognitions include Hispanic Leadership Award recipient, the Hispanic Fund, Community Foundation of Greater Lorain County, Man of the Year recipient, First Community Interfaith Institute, Ohio Distinguished Hispanic recipient, Ohio Commission on Spanish Speaking Affairs, Certificate of Special Congressional Recognition, Congress of the United States, U.S. House of Representatives, and Certificate of Personal Commitment, Ohio Commission on Minority Health, Minority Health Movement in Ohio. He is credentialed as an Ohio Certified Prevention Specialist Assistant and holds a BA from Kent State University and a Juris Doctorate from Cleveland Marshall College of Law. Dr. Wimbiscus obtained her undergraduate degree in plant and soil science from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland and her medical degree from the University of Tennessee College of Medicine. 
She completed her adult psychi psychiatry residency and child psychiatry fellowship as chief at Cleveland Clinic. She was co-director of the medical humanities course at Lerner College of Medicine and program director for child and adolescent psychiatry. She currently provides care at neighborhood family practice and directs the school mental health program at Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Wimbiscuit has served on the school board of the Near West Intergenerational School since 2010 and is chair of Intergenerational Cleveland. She also serves on the Woodruff Foundation Board. Zuleika Ruiz is the director of programs for Esperanza Inc. in Cleveland, Ohio. She has served the organization for nine years. Esperanza reaches 1,000 individuals every year. Zuleika oversees all programming at Esperanza and is responsible for developing plans and reports for funders and potential sites. She also conducts symposiums and trainings about family engagement and youth programs. Zuleika started the family engagement program and laid out the groundwork for the expansion of Esperanza's unique parents program. Most recently, she became involved in working with groups conducting research in the health and educational field. Zuleika passionately believes in the power of education to expand human potential. She knows that education transforms lives and shapes new visions. In the realm of life, she believes education is necessary to lead in a globally complex world. Grounded in her earliest years as a family worker, Zuleika's career has encompassed all levels of organizational leadership, development, and management for educational nonprofit programs. She has also been the chair of the Latina Advisory Board of the Domestic Violence Center for over five years. In that capacity, she provides expertise to create partnership opportunities and awareness of the program. Zuleika earned a BA in elementary education from Inter-American University of Puerto Rico and a MED from Caribbean University of Puerto Rico in special education. In addition, she participated in trainings and institutes such as the True Mart Youth Development Fellowship Program from Case Western Reserve University, YWCA Quest Institute, and BVU. Thank you and welcome to our panelists. unmute myself. Okay, great. Can everyone hear me? Okay, wonderful. So good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is um, Marisa Hollinshead, and I'm um, here to present to you today on understanding the mental health needs of Latinx youth through lived experiences. Um, this topic as a second generation Mexican American female is, um, you know, it really strikes a personal chord with me. And I know others um, in this room, including the panelists. And, you know, our goal today is really to elevate the Latinx adolescent voice and to use these findings and um, the areas that they brought up as ways that hopefully we can inform change. So thank you so much for being part of this discussion and presentation today. Hold on just a second. It doesn't look like my slides are advancing. Let me try again. I'm just reopening, hold on just a second.
Okay, let's try this again. Okay, here we go. So before we start, um, I know people have met Molly, Nelson, Zuleika. Thank you so much for being part of this um, presentation today. I also wanted to introduce you to other members of our interdisciplinary team. Dr. Sarah Koopman Gonzalez, who was um, really integral in developing our interview guide. Dr. Erica Trappel, who was um, so enthusiastic about this project, 100% uh, supportive and on board. And then everyone who knows Jean Frank, the Director of Adolescent Surveillance and Evaluation knows that she's just a force of nature and uh, just completely supportive. So I just wanted to thank everyone before we start. So I thought I could really structure this conversation and presentation today around the guiding principles that Nelson Ramirez really helped us create around this topic. So he always says, you know, we need to identify the issues. So the issue being, um, mental health in the Latinx adolescent community, creating a sense of urgency about what's going on within our community, raising awareness, and then mobilizing our resources. And I hope I can touch on all of these things today during our conversation. So as far as identifying the issue, um, this was a quote taken from a 16-year-old female uh, during one of our focus groups. And when we were talking about anxiety and depression, and she said to me, I don't even know if this makes sense, but I just feel like I'm not even here. I feel like everything is going on around me and I'm just there. So this project was really birthed from the Cuyahoga County Youth Risk Behavior Survey. The YRBS has served as a local source of data about those behaviors that contribute most to illness and death among adults. Thanks to Jean and collaborators, for 10 years now, we've had consistently collected county level data. So that's both at the middle school and high school level, which is pretty amazing. The categories of risk that I'm gonna be talking today are depressive symptoms and suicide. And one of the things that, one of the reasons why this really came about was our project has really been guided by our YRBS advisory committee who really does a great job of making sure to elevate and prioritize county findings for additional analysis and creation of dissemination products. When we talk about the Latinx youth population, it's really important to know what parts of Cuyahoga County we're talking about. The survey um, collects data and reports mostly um, a larger population of Latinx youth on the Cleveland West, Inner Ring West and Outer Ring West side of, of Cuyahoga County. So I wanted to just start by the inception of this project and um, the way that the survey frames depressive symptoms, I just wanted to, to define that for the group. So during the past 12 months, the survey asks, did you ever feel so sad or hopeless for two or more weeks in a row that you stopped doing some usual activities? So this one survey item assesses three indicators of a major depressive episode, experience of one extended, two, sadness and hopelessness resulting in three interruptions of usual activities. Therefore, an affirmative response to this item is referred to as depressive symptoms. One of the great things about YRBS is it really can serve as a frame of reference at the level, at the local level and at the national level. So if we look nationally at the US in 2013, when all of this, um, when we were really kind of starting this conversation about depressive symptoms in Latinx youth, we see that at the national level, three in 10 teens um, experience depressive symptoms. If we boil down and then look at the Latinx Hispanic community, it's one in three teens. And if we look at Latinas in particular, it's about 50% state that they have depressive symptoms. Now, if we look at Cuyahoga County in 2013, it was one in four teens said that they had depressive symptoms. And if we dig into this a little bit further, we look into the Latinx Hispanic overall population, it's two of five teens. And in Latinas, again, consistent with the national one in two teens, so 50%. 
We also ask about suicide attempts, specifically during the 12 months before the survey, um, did you attempt suicide one or more times? Again, at the national level, we saw that one in 14 teens had attempted suicide. For the Latinx Hispanic youth, it was one in 10. And for Latinas, it was one in six at the national level. In Cuyahoga County, we saw that it was one in 10 teens overall who had attempted suicide within the past 12 months. And if we look at the Latinx Hispanic population, we see it's one in five. And this is overall uh, for the Latinx Hispanic population. And then this is also um, for the Latina population. So no differences. So this really um, was a motivator for us to create a sense of urgency. Again, this is a quote taken from a female 15 years of age when talking about anxiety and depression with the group. And she said, you try to talk to somebody that you trust and then you realize that they don't care. And then you realize that nobody cares. So it was really our advisory committee um, for the YRBS that elevated this topic. Um, this was the first brief that came out of the YRBS and it was really driven by the advisory committee. A subcommittee was formed and recommendations were made as part of that subcommittee. And one of those recommendations, which we, we really took to heart was to develop and disseminate with input from community stakeholder, stakeholders, culturally sensitive educational materials on mental health for adolescents, providers, and community members. So we moved to raising awareness on this topic. Again, this is a female from a focus group saying, the fear of just having to tell someone that might not understand or view it, anxiety or depression, the same way you do. Jean and I went back and took a look and over the course of five to six years, there were 14 presentations made on depressive symptoms within the Latinx adolescent community. We also made dissemination products to try and just spread awareness of this topic. Um, Nelson Ramirez played an integral part, also developing a, a curriculum called La Mariposa as part of Hispanic UMADOP for adolescent youth. So in terms of mobilizing resources, um, this is a quote from a male in the focus groups. Again, when talking about anxiety and depression, we're not good enough. That's what causes us to have anxiety and depression because we feel like we're not as perfect than other people because we feel like they're better. Um, at this point, um, we really started thinking deeply about what our next steps were going to be. The YRBS does an excellent job of creating a snapshot of youth risk behavior. But when talking to community members during our presentations, we heard from them that we really should be talking to youth and we really couldn't agree more. Um, they told us they wanted focus groups. Um, so we um, felt that that would be extremely important. And we really wanted to talk to the youth, to hear their voice, and have them tell us what their felt needs and perspectives are around this topic. So that led us to um, writing and applying for the Schubert Center Seed Grant. I like to always present the plan. Um, our plan was to conduct three focus groups. Um, we had developed an interview guide. Um, our plan was to go back, transcribe the interviews, and then you know, kind of tweak our interview guide um, based on those focus groups. Our plan and um, thanks to Zuleika and Esperanza, we were gonna recruit new interview participants, interview them, transcribe those interviews, you know, analyze our data. We we're gonna have a final report and presentation done by April of last year and write a manuscript, identify opportunities for future work. So that was the plan. This was our reality. Um, so we did great in the fall. Um, again, we felt that this was really important to conduct our focus groups and our interviews within the community setting. Um, Zuleika and others really just were amazing in recruiting in October. We had already conducted our three focus groups. So we did um, three groups of 10. So 10 females, a group of 10 males, and then a mixed group of five and five. We went back, we transcribed our interviews, 
we revised our interview guide just slightly. And then we started, thanks to Zuleika, recruiting new inter interview participants. Um, that all kind of that whole process was really January, February, March, and then COVID hit. Um, so we were only able to do 18 interviews. Um, we, 12 of them were female, six of them male, average age of 16 years of age. We still went back, transcribed our interviews, analyzed our data, and we're presenting some of our preliminary findings to you today. But we felt that just given what was going on and the sensitivity of our topic, that um, it wouldn't be appropriate at this time to, to go back and continue our collection. So I thought now, like just, you know, we can speak with our panelists, but I thought framing the rest of this conversation around the research questions would be helpful, just for you to kind of think about some of the things that we were interested in exploring and talking to the youth. So I wanted to start with just the first question, and this was just generally conceptualizing mental health. My original concern, you know, I'm sure a lot of us are aware, but there's such stigma around mental health. And one of my concerns was really, you know, are adolescents going to be willing to talk about this? It's really sensitive. I'm a stranger. How are they going to be? Um, so I thought just starting with a warm up of, you know, what words, what language are you using? And how are you talking with your friends and your family and social media about this topic? Um, much to my surprise, it was absolutely amazing. Um, they had, the youth had so much to say. They have so much insight on this topic. Um, it was really moving and um, powerful for me. One of the things that uh, came up um, that I found interesting and was really kind of this contrast of, of how they're speaking with parents or a guardian around mental health and how they're speaking with their friends around mental health. Um, so, you know, when talking to parents and, and guardians, they really kind of used words that represented them shutting down. So shyness or feeling quiet. Um, there were no words to explain how they were feeling. They felt that parents or guardians weren't, they weren't really respecting each other when we were, they were talking about the topic. Um, when parents would ask, they would use words like, I'll get over it, or it's nothing, I'll be okay. So kind of minimizing or internalizing what some of the, some of the things that were, were going on with them. Um, one of the themes and kind of a recurrent issue that came up was some of the youth felt that their problems felt less or minimized compared to what their parents were going through. And so it really kind of felt inappropriate for them to, to, um, to be talking about this. When it came to friends though, different language. So feeling depressed, out of control, you know, more being, having the ability to be more open, um, using that explicit language to be able to express themselves a little bit better. When we were interested in looking at important factors from the youth perspective about contributions to mental health, we kind of wanted to start a little bit broad and then narrow it down um, to more unique factors to the Latinx population. And so some of the big themes that came out from this area or this topic were, were kind of big general themes of financial problems, you know, education, youth employment, um, interfering with ed education and relationships. And so I just wanted to read just a couple um, of these quotes from youth that I felt kind of captured some of the sentiment. So for financial problems, some Latinos can't get jobs. People with bad backgrounds can't get homes. There's a lot, where to get food, um, a lot of stuff. My mom needed help paying bills. We don't have our bills paid and I was helping her. She prefers me going to college instead of struggling. Around education, like when, are we, like when we're in school, we get anxious because of the teacher, principals, homework, when you got like too much work to do. And then youth employment, but now, but now that I'm back in school, I can't get money like I was before, so it's stressing me out. Or I felt like the job was taking away my focus in school and I want to be able to graduate and go to college. I forgot my homework because I was working or I was too tired because I got to go to work. And for relationships, you don't only worry about yourself, you worry about your friends. You worry about yourself, you worry about your family. 
Like you can have anxiety over so many things and I don't like opening up either. So I get anxious. So I wanted to pause here and, um, and bring in the panelists at this point. And so Nelson, um, it appears that youth consider their families of ultimate importance here. Their mental health is wrapped up in so much more than just themselves. How can we leverage this in positive ways and to their benefit? Yeah, that was, that was most interesting to see that. Uh, we all know, <clears throat> excuse me, we all know uh, the importance of family, right? The, and the benefits to, to community of, of, of belonging to families, uh, meeting the basic needs, uh, emotional needs, the social needs, developing values and, and sharing and, and, and uh, culture and, and tradition. And um, so by, by families meeting these needs, you know, we're and promoting social growth, uh, communities benefit by having uh, healthy contributing individuals. And so uh, I, was, I was encouraged to, to see that uh, the youth are, have, a, have a very strong grasp, a firm grasp of this importance of family and looking beyond themselves uh, with regards to, to that family structure. Uh, the travesty is uh, that this characteristic really came at a, at a great loss and, mm -hmm. and it, and, or a great cost, I should say, at a great cost. And it is the mental health of, of the kids. Uh, I think underlining and, and very general, unfortunately, kids are not allowed to be kids now. They have now have to be not only the recipient of the beautiful uh, benefits that, that a, a, a household provides, but now they have to be the ones that have to, that have to be the providers. And, and that's, that's a shift uh, for, for youth nowadays. And it's evident, um, and, and what, seeing, what we're seeing is that uh, the, the Latin youth are currently right now blinded by this immediate financial employment and education pressures. And, and, and they are unable to really see what is what what positive growth they are gaining mm -hmm. okay and and it's being overshadowed just by pressure okay i mean we all we all i, I recall in you know i'm an old timer all right i'm going to be i'm going to be 68 years old uh in, in in the first of june and and i grew up in the mid 60s i'm a from puerto rican descent uh born and raised in the city of lorraine and i don't remember conversations of economics in the house, concerns of my parents not having this or that, okay? Now, I, I do know, and I did recognize that other people may have more, or when they got a gift of a, of a racetrack kit, it was a fancy one in an eight, eight shape, and mine was an oval, but I was satisfied with that. But now, these kids actually have to contribute a whole lot just to maintain the household, and now they're becoming now they're becoming adults. So how do we leverage that? Uh, the, the positive thing is that we we got to be careful, uh, and we got to be mindful not to overburden them in in trying to leverage this characteristic of their understanding of the strength of families and and, and looking beyond themselves. Because what they're really doing, they're right now developing resiliency. And that is going to be a, a benefit for them and others, but they don't yet realize that. So we have to kind of, we have to kind of, in our leveraging, focus them to understand that they are now, even though it's traumatic, even though it's painful, even though they, they have uncertainty, but, but, but they are getting through this. And in the end run, they, they are really acquiring a most important characteristic to succeed in life, which is uh, resiliency. So very quickly, uh, because of their interest in, in the benefit of their family and the community and, 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 and how, how they fit in that, uh, activities that that allow kids to 
echo echo mad community is a way to engage them there to identify and connect youth with necessary health mental health and other social information services because they, they already know that they have to draw that into their families work with youth to identify uh concrete uh needs that that they want to address okay um and and come up with list of of that of ways to achieve these these um, desires that they have, and then guiding them through through immediate action because there is a, a surge of energy that they do have right now. They they are really um, they're focused and and they know that they need to improve these areas for not only their families or or themselves, the financial, the education, and the youth. Um, obviously, one of the best ways to do all of this is to encourage youth to identify and participate in leadership opportunities. Uh, such as peer-to-peer -peer discussions where they can share. They can share their successes and accomplishment in managing stress and functioning and uh, well, even in spite of these adversities. And uh, my, my last point that I would make would be that um, some basic relaxation techniques for kids so that they're they're familiar with, with how to breathe, uh, perspective and, and just to, to engage in some self wellness. Thank you, Nelson. Um, Zuleika, yeah, Zuleika, there, uh, there appears to be you know, going through this a real layering effect, right, of, of stress for youth. So employment, education, all of these things, they, they spiral around each other. So they are interdependent. Um, how have you in your role approached this layering effect? And what are some culturally appropriate strategies we could utilize to relieve some of the burden for our youth? First, thank you for this great opportunity. I'm, I'm very happy and honored to be here. Um, I want to say that in my role in the community, we, um, I mean, we are really deep connected with the community. And we, every single program that we bring into organizations like Esperanza are pretty much answering a community needs. So basically for us to be able to understand the community we serve, we have to ask them. We have to make sure that the students and the families that we are receiving, we have to sit down and listen. We have to listen to them. And we also have to understand that even though, even though I, I am Hispanic, that doesn't mean that everybody is coming and facing the same challenges. We have mm -hmm. families that they come to us, that they are very well prepared, they have everything, so they just need just a push. But we have some other families that are facing really, really hard traumas, PTSD, stigmas, stamps. So, and that comes and translate into their children and into their youth. So at Esperanza, we have our family engagement program and people that is really dedicated to also make sure and ensure that we are also connected. Because when you talk about those layering effects of economics, education, youth employment, relationship in these roles, you have to know your community and you have to know what is out there. Um, because it's really important for us that before we ask the students that they have to perform at school, we need to make sure that they have it together. And I think that um, translates into the big um, heavy lift that we are putting into these children and youths when they're coming to United States, maybe without wanting. So they're here, they have no option. So, and then as a parent, we are taking them to these big schools, new language, new people, diversity, acculturation. So we don't think about the external factors that are also out there that are affecting these youth and the children that are putting a stress on them. And it's leading into these uh, mental health problems that because of families not knowing where to seek for help, for different challenges, um, we are seeing the struggle of our youths. 
Thank you, Zuleika. I think, you know, you touched on some things that we're going to now like dig into a little bit and some of the unique challenges that you're talking about right now for this population and how they experience, you know, in their relation to mental health. And so, you know, a big theme for us that came out through our focus groups and our, and our interviews were, was centered around discrimination and language barriers. Um, you'll notice that, you know, there's, again, this layering effect and so much overlap with some of these quotes and some of the ones that I felt were kind of relevant to both themes I kind of tried to put in the center, but I wanted to just to capture for the group a little bit of discrimination and some examples that were given. Um, so it was this lady on the porch, American woman, she started yelling at us and telling us to get off her lawn. She kept saying, you don't belong here. And that made us feel uncomfortable. And he, meaning this um, subject's cousin, started crying because he felt bad. And, and I felt bad because she was pushing us away. There are some people that are racist and don't accept how we are and how we were born. We don't really get to pick what race we get to be. You don't speak English, you come here, everybody's looking at you weird and you have a thicker accent than anybody else. And it just makes people think, you know, bad things like, oh, we shouldn't hang out with them because they're different. They're not like us. We're reading out loud and they, meaning teachers, be like, oh, can you read out loud? They, meaning the youth, don't want to because they don't know how to talk, how to talk much English the right way. They feel like people are gonna make fun of them or laugh at them. And then as far as parents in this family theme, so like if they parents don't know English, they depend on you, scheduling appointments, go to the store, doing everything for them. So Nelson, I'm gonna pause here before we kind of dive into another layer here and just ask you, you know, kids at this age, I think just in general, really just wanna fit in. Um, language came up in a way that Latinx youth feel separated from, stereotyped and discriminated against by others. What role does language play when thinking about lived experiences of racism for the Latinx community? What other forms exist that may be unique to the Latinx community? That's a big, big topic. And, yeah. um, but understanding and, and valuing cultural diversity are the keys to countering racism and discrimination. Uh, all individuals must, must feel free to explore their uniqueness of their culture and identity while developing understanding of cultural diversity that exists in their community. And, and that is central to what is happening to these kids. They're almost, they're almost being forced to deny their cultural and their language, okay? So they can assimilate a, uh, uh, into and acculturate in, into the system. And, and that does not bode because we know, we know that it is through cultural uh, language and 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 just just in in embedded in in the in the cultural experience is where they the youth are going to develop their own values. Uh, they're they're going to uh, develop their own confidence level. Uh, they they start looking and shaping the world. So uh, being and understanding and embracing their culture. Uh, is very important for for their development, and uh, obviously there's two ways that 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 we get to that uh, even when I was growing up that um, would be a way of pointing at me that I'm different. Okay, uh, it's either going to be my language or it's going to be my color, and and even believe it or not, I did have hair at one time. Even the even even the curliness of your hair. So those are two things that that are, and I love the quote, you know, we don't get, what was it? We, we don't get born or we don't get to, um, there it is. Uh, we are, we, and what is it? We don't really get to pick our race. I'm sorry. We don't really yeah. get to pick our race. So, so they're there, right? And, um, but that's one of the confrontations that they, they are feeling is that they're really being asked to give up. But at the same time, they know that it is this language, it is this cultural uh, unity that they have that makes them strong, that, that makes them understand who they are, and that pushes 
uh, and, and drives the success for healthy families and, and, for, the, and for themselves. Um, so language is, is most important for them, but it seems like there's a, a double standard that they're going through uh, for them, okay? Language all of a sudden is a deficit, but mm -hmm. for other non-Latinos, having and understanding other languages is an asset and, and one that they desire and go after to achieve it and, and, and obtain. Mm -hmm. but, but when they're out, when they're out there speaking the language, then they, they are looked at as, as the deficit for them. Um, And of course, as, as uh, Zuleika indicated, uh, this constant migration that's coming in uh, and this ebb and flow of, of the Latino community that comes from different parts of the, of the world, okay, and most certainly uh, of, uh, of the world, um, there's always going to be a need for individuals to understand their language and be able to communicate because they're going to have to uh, negotiate all of the institutions, uh, services, and whatever, um, in in a way that would to have access for them, and it's going to be. And I recall even myself always having to be the one that goes to the doctors, that goes to the schools, that goes to the to the banks, that go wherever, and and have to be that translator and that that person that is going to try to um, connect the services for 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 their parents. And um, so I kind of, uh, language definitely is, is both, for them it's is becoming a, 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 a schizophrenic situation where they're looking at it both as a deficit, but most certainly uh, they, they feel that it's a necessary for them to continue to identify who they are and how they are going to negotiate uh, the institutions that they find themselves in. Yeah, I love that point that you bring up about language and how it really is an asset, you know, like just being in healthcare and how many Spanish speaking patients I get to see and being able to utilize that skill set, it goes such a long way. Um, so I love that idea of reshaping this for it to, you know, this is a skill, this is an asset, this is something that makes you unique and special. Um, yeah, and, and what's sad in, in, in our, you know, my own lived experience in, in the area that, of the in Lorraine City where I work, I mean, live, uh, I remember walking to junior high and it was a, a cosmopolitan walk. It was like three miles, but I'd be walking through African-American community, Italian community, uh, Slovenian community, Croatian community, Mexican community, uh, Hungarian communities before I even made it home, to, before I made it to school and back home. And guess what? Hearing all of those languages, mm -hmm. making friends and being able to, uh, to be invited to eat something in a different place. So that, that has always been a positive for us. And now it seems like it, it isn't. Now, now it's a it's a deficit and and a, a a huge weight for these youth to be able to navigate and succeed in all that of in their aspect of, of their life, whether it's in school, whether it's in family and just in the community. Thank you, Nelson. So I get, so just kind of continuing on the theme for unique challenges, um, you know, immigration and intergenerational challenges also came up. So in terms of immigration, a lot of stress is if you're just coming here, meaning the U.S. and you don't know English, it's really, really stressful and learning it and understanding everything. Because if you can't understand, then it's, then like it's really hard. I was so stressed out and sad because I don't, I don't got my family and I just moved to a different country. I think that they, meaning the youth, are so sad and they just miss their country. 
And then they, meaning parents, depend on you, especially like me, because I came here only with my mom and my brother and my dad is in Puerto Rico. So it's kind of hard, like not seeing your dad every single day and learning how to grow into men because you only have your mom and you have to learn how to be a man. Um, this in itself was such a, a, you know, like a reoccurring theme that came up with the males that I spoke with. Um, but in terms of intergenerational challenges as well, this quote I found to be extremely powerful. Um, it's like a straight road. You can't turn this way. You can't turn that way. You just got to keep straight. For us, it's like that. We have to stay on the straight road. We turn, we're done. It's like one road and on the side is a cliff. We turn a little bit and that's it. And then when you come here, they, your parents expect a lot from you. They expect you to bring home good grades, but they don't know the reality. You can't focus because everything going on around you. So Molly, I wanted to turn to you and just ask, you know, these youth described that they have to stay on a straight road. There's so little flexibility for them at this time of adolescence when flexibility is so important. Could you reflect on this pressure that youth can feel? Yes, and, and Marisa, I just wanna say thank you so much for including me in this panel. And, and I'm so certainly feeling somewhat vulnerable and a little uncertain to be sitting on a panel with such distinguished and important panelists. And I'm aware of my position as a white female physician and that I am coming at this from being a caregiver and somebody who deeply cares about the wellness and the mental wellness of youth, but I'm certainly no expert. Um, and so I'm just happy to contribute and support this important um, mission. When we think about, you know, being on a straight and narrow road that, you know, and reflecting on what Nelson and Zuleika have already highlighted, the youth um, are, are sitting there in a space where they're managing so much. Typical adolescence, right? Which is a straight and narrow road, sometimes in our minds, because we have the pressures of trying to accommodate the adults that we love. And these youth in their comments have shared how important family and community is and how important it is to fit in and have the approval of your families. And I think that's a really important piece that, and that's, that's significant within this cohort that you've described, how important those relationships are. And so sometimes taking that challenge and making sure that's emphasized as a strength is critical because we know how important those multi-generational relationships are. And then also trying to fit in with your peers. This is the time where status matters. This is a very typical experience. You wanna fit in with your adolescents and have their approval. And so you're navigating so much. And within these, these youth's comments, as they think about their job responsibilities, maintaining financial stability of their home, thinking about where resources are coming from and being a student is tremendously um, exhausting. And I think validating that is the first thing that we can do as we're sort of sitting in this, so as a physician sitting in a vulnerable space with a youth who, who doesn't necessarily wanna come and ask for help, but, but may know or may have had the opportunity to be directed for care to sit there and identify and recognize that these are typical experiences and challenges and you are doing a tremendously important job in trying to navigate the world with all of these different pressures that you're experiencing. So staying in the straight and narrow is important, but also recognizing that too much flexibility can be challenging. So when the kids say I have different structures within my home, within my community, within my school, those structures are important and maintaining them, making sure that they're still avail available for the youth is really important because having security and structure and your traditions is essential for also maintaining your identity because this is the age, again, of identity um, as Erickson described, sort of identity versus role confusion. This is adolescence. Um, and, and then the, the, oh, the other piece I just wanna mention, and, and we may talk about this further down, but, um, Sometimes kids are also, when they make it to a mental health clinic, oftentimes they're struggling with not just mental health challenges on the normal continuum of stress or adverse stress. Um, they may be struggling with something that would cross over into a mental illness. And remember there's a continuum and we wanna be careful not to create too many um, labels, but recognizing that expressing identity and exploring identity, figuring out who we are as an adolescent is critical 
And if we don't feel supported in our sexuality, in our relationships, and how we express ourselves, that can be tremendously um, harmful for a youth. So trying to, to collaborate with all the adults in the youth's life, parents, family, grandparents, teachers, um, the wonderful programs at Esperanza and Umadop and elsewhere in the community to support youth as they're going through identity struggles is um, also very important. Thank you. Um, Zuleika, I just quickly, I kind of, I have one more like set of slides that I wanted to get to before we take for questions, but I just want to ask you quickly, and I'm sorry to cut your question short, but you know, one theme that's kind of was coming up during our conversation with youth is that they feel that their mental health problems kind of add to the burden or challenges of their families. And so they feel that their problems aren't as, as important as, their as the challenges that their families are facing. You know, have you experienced this working with parents and youth around mental health? And, you know, what are some of the ways that we can better support these conversations or create trustworthy spaces for youth to express how they're feeling? Sorry, I know it's a big question for a small time frame, but no, I mean, to... I'm going to be brief. So definitely in the Hispanic Latino community, you don't talk about mental health. Yeah. So if you talk about mental health, um, that is a taboo. Unfortunately, there is not a lot, a lot of education around um, mental health. The things that people can tell you is that if you go to a psychiatrist and they prescribe something that's going to get in your record, um, you are a youth, you are a child, you cannot um, feel depressed because your problems are not bigger than mine because I'm the adult. So, and that comes back to what I was mentioned about all the stress that we have um, putting our children's and youth shoulders that express in different um, ways, expressing them being um, quiet, in them not performing at school. So in different and many ways, that without counting, I mean, the many people, I mean, any age, that even as an adult, they don't believe in mental health services. So I wanna say that I wanna see in the community, every single community, a more awareness of what mental health is. Mm -hmm. And also that in the same way that when we feel sick physically, we need to take care of our mental health. And I think there is so much around of taking care of your cholesterol, and, which is important, but there is not many education around the stigmas that we have in the mental health field for youths, for children, for adults. Um, there is a lot of adults there that need mental health services that because of many and different challenges, whatever it is, access to, I mean, healthcare insurance. We have immigrant parents that they don't know that their child can get their medical benefits. So those children that might need that assistance are not getting it just because the misinformation that is out there. So one thing that I would like to see um, expanding in the community is that campaign of what mental health is and what breaking those stigmas and those taboos of, I'm gonna go to the psychiatrist, I'm gonna get 10 days in the whatever floor, in whatever hospital, because I'm crazy. I'm not crazy. I'm in a stage where we need to realize when it's too much, who I look on my side that can help me coping as a head of my family that I can transition that into my children. Think about when parents pass through divorce. Do they look for help? No, they just go, they get divorced. And like the quote of that child saying, I am here, my father is in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Listen to that. So some people need, and every single person in one point of their life, they need a counselor, they need a psychologist, they need a psychi psychiatrist, and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That, all, that also segues into this next topic, which is, um, you know, this was the most important, personally for me meant the most in terms of really trying to probe the youth on, on unmet need for specific mental health services or interventions within the population. And these were just um, three themes that like really popped out to us that, 
you know, there were these, this layer of vulnerability. So, you know, just for the sake of time, kid, kids really being concerned about if they are to open up what the consequences are, um, you know, child protective services going to get involved because, you know, their parents believe that, you know, their punishment is sometimes they get hit. So are, you know, child protective services going to be involved? Can they talk to counselors openly about what their problems are? So kids, kids say they talk and they might go to counselors, but not actually tell the counselor what's going on because they're scared or they feel like they're not going to be helped. Um, another theme that came up for some kids, I don't wanna say all, but for some youth, they said that they really don't have anywhere to go for help. This was really shocking to me. Um, so there's like no point of speaking up because nobody's gonna hear you. Um, not gonna lie, some of them, meaning youth, just keep it to, in themselves. They don't tell anybody. Most kids say, I only got myself, that's all I need, and there's nobody but me. Um, that was really shocking. So help, uh, one of the interesting things that really came out of this for me was help was really person dependent, not place dependent. So this idea of trust was such a central theme. Um, and so kind of Molly, you know, when you were mentioning doctors to your point, so I was really interested in, in physicians and like what if kids were open to talking. And so one, one common theme was, you know, for me, I need to trust, um, like I need to know that person. It's not like I can go into that doctor's office. I can't do it. So really not being able to talk to doctors um, about these issues. People want, you know, youth wanted people that were supportive. Um, we have to try to build trust within each other. And I think if it's someone you trust that you can see on a daily basis, they'll know if you feel some type of way. So Nelson, we've said all along that this really needs to be a multifaceted approach. And, and Zuleika already touched on that um, with her previous comment. You know, for example, parent and community education, health organization mobilization and resource dissemination efforts. What are some of the things that we are already doing well and where do we need to go with this? Okay. Well, I like to think that uh, in my no, uh, almost four or five years of being involved with the uh, Youth Risk Behavior Advisory Committee, that um, when I was leading Hispanic Human Death, we were looking at these, uh, these results with regards to depressive symptoms and, and particularly the Latino girls. Uh, so um, we took that and we took a, an initiative, first of all, to begin some awareness to go out of the community. Uh, we've done dozens of presentations and all that, but, but it's still a very slow process. So as an organization, we decided then that let's identify a, a program curriculum uh, that, that, would, uh, that would hone in and, and address uh, depressive symptoms in girls in particular and Latina specifically. And we were fortunate enough that we did. Uh, we were fortunate enough to identify uh, as mentioned earlier, La, La Mariposa, uh, the Girls Empowerment Program. And um, we developed a wonderful relationship with the, uh, the founder and, and creator of that curriculum, Nancy Rodan uh, Johnson. And um, that was uh, the beginning, the genesis for us to really begin to make an impact. And, it, and the, the curriculum calls for uh, for, for these young girls to really explore themselves, to understand what the community is saying about them, to, for them to become strong in their own self of who they are, to see what are their own personal assets that they have, uh, to affirm themselves and, and use a lot of journaling, which is so important for them. Uh, whether it's poems, whether it's just sentences, whether it's little storytelling, using art, and, 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 and pictures and painting. And then of course, engaging them in connectivity with the community. That's all very important too. And when we did that, when we were, we were engaging them in community connectivity, guess what? The parents also followed. So now you're, now you're, getting, in, now you're getting the parents fully engaged in, in this process with, with, the young, uh, with these young ladies. And then, of course, you have to celebrate. I think that we don't do enough celebration as it is when, when for, for our uh, successes and, 
the work that we do. And when we celebrate, we put all of that out uh, so that their parents could, could see that. And what we heard uh, anecdotally was that, wow, the girls are having better relationship with their, with their siblings. They have better relationship with their teachers, they're telling us. Their grades are going up. They're, they're, they're more positive and willing to uh, participate in, 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 in the more personalized way with their parents, which is something that this survey is showing that they're almost di disconnected with their parents, but, but this allowed them to become a, more uh, connected with them. So I like to think that that is one of the, one of the uh, responses uh, that organizations and, and communities could do. Uh, but of course, uh, there, there's, there are organizations out there that are, that are to serve the community, the, the Latino X community. I mean, we have the Cleveland Clinic that has an Hispanic um, at Lutheran Hospital with its, uh, its Hispanic clinic. Metro Health has a Hispanic clinic with, with uh, professionals in, in the area of general health. Uh, mental health, nutrition, et cetera. Of course, Hispanic Humidab in its way of, of providing bicultural, bilingual uh, prevention and, and treatment. Uh, Esperanza, which uh, Zuleila uh, indicated uh, how they work closely with mentoring programs and, and engaging families. Uh, the Spanish American Committee uh, that, that has programs for enriching families, home ownership. Uh, Julio de Burgos, uh, is it a cultural arts center that it's available to transform life so that they can, again, continue that connectivity with their culture. We don't want to eliminate it, okay? There's, we, you are, we are cutting our, our heads off as a society if we are going to try to er, uh, erase culture and history and tradition, okay? Because that is the essence of growth and that is the essence of value and that's how communities grow and, and prosper. So Julio uh, Cultural Center, we have the Nueva Luz Urban Research Center that doing marvelous work with HIV AIDS and also with uh, working with youth in after school programs and self-discipline uh, through, through martial arts out, out of all things, okay? so. Of course, uh, the Cleveland Diocese of, of um, Catholic Charities, they have a Hispanic uh, service office that, that provides uh, outpatient alcohol and, and, and drug treatment program and Hispanic Senior Center where, where there can be some generational activities. Uh, so there are out there, but I think that there needs to be now uh, bringing them closer together, uh, that they collaborate better, uh, that, that they are, work and develop specific um, goals and objectives as a community and where these organizations could then provide necessary services for, for youth and, and adults. Thank you, Nelson. Um, I would love to continue this conversation, but I do want to make sure that we leave a little bit of time for any questions. Um, so um, let me just uh, make sure to thank everyone who's been a part of this project um, and this, um, this conversation today. I, I can't say thank you enough. I, I, really, I really appreciate all of your support. Um, and, um, and just wanted to open it up now to, to questions from, um, from the rest of the attendees. And as a, to remind you that we, you can um, ask a question using the Q&A feature or you can use the raise hand feature to request that your microphone be unmuted. So we have one question for Zuleika. Um, what would you say is the greatest challenge you see when working with parents and trying to equip them in order to help their children succeed? It's, I think the most difficult, it's breaking those stigmas of nobody's gonna take away your child because you are not doing the job as a parent, that's the first thing they said. So I failed as a parent. Why is my child passing through this? And, and it's just um, listening, that's what I say that when you work in nonprofits and when you work with the community, you have like kind of different hats, 
without having the titles and being very careful of not crossing the line of becoming diagnosing something. So it's just sitting down with them and making sure that they understand what is the problem and finding those um, community resources and those partners that we have out there to be able to assist them with whatever the need is. I can tell you that um, when we talk about those diagnosis for the IP when they don't understand the IP. What is ADHD? What is bipolar disorder? What is, I mean, X, Y, and Z? Because when they go to the provider, they don't feel that they can ask those questions or they have a translator that is a person there and they cannot maybe express themselves in a way that, that they want it because we cannot forget that culture plays a role in the person. And they might use some um, quotes that we use in different parts of the Hispanic Latino community that maybe the translator maybe don't understand what it means. And, and it's when you have the opportunity to talk in your own native language that you can really express. And, and also, I mean, it, it's having that compassion, that compassion of knowing that when I'm sitting with them, and I know when, I mean, people that work for Esperanza sit with them, we, we have that compassion. And, and, and I say, you know what, I have a legal status. I'm blessed, but this person is facing and passing through all of this. Plus now they have a child, they have a youth that also is adding to that um, stress. And remember when a parent have two, one job, three jobs, maybe the last thing they think it's about looking for services for mental health because you cannot see those until they really trigger like an anxiety attack so that you have to go to the hospital or those outbursts that we see in youth and we see in children. So, um, and that's what I keep saying that is, is the most difficult piece is just to break those uh, these stigmas, taboos and making sure that they really follow through those um, referrals and services, which is very important. I would just quickly like to add that, and I, it's been my soapbox for the past few years at all levels, is that um, we really need to understand with regards to the professional behavioral health community, uh, whether or uh, we, we need to understand that there is a huge gap in bilingual, bicultural uh, behavioral health specialists. Um, we, we don't, as, as a community, even at the state level, uh, we, are they do we do not understand the the significance of this particular gap and we need to study as to whether or not we need to study to find out what is the projection of bilingual bicultural behavioral health specialists that are going to be graduating and licensed in the state of Ohio over the next 2 to 5 years because right now there is a huge void uh, because of this, and uh, it is, it really uh, um, puts many challenging goals when parents. So that is hugely important for us to really make it an urgency to understand and uh, this gap of bilingual bicultural and understand how many kids are going to be entering and graduating uh, in that field. Uh, because if we don't, uh, we're going to really lose ground and significantly lose, lose ground and won't be able to meet these challenges right now that we are seeing in these uh, studies. Nelson, I strongly agree with you. And I think one, one solution as we're, you know, collaborating is to think about um, medical schools and professional schools and how to actively recruit and be in the and be present with youth early on in their life to say these are opportunities and we have mentors and we're excited to expose you to all sorts of different careers because you are so needed. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and you know there there's a there's an effort going that I've seen uh, Metro Health Hospital they have they have a high school within their, within their uh, institution and being a behavioral health institution, there's going to be a lot of that kind of discussion going in there. So that's, that's a wonderful start. 
Okay, uh, but but we do need to really make an emphasis to to really grab, be able to put our hands around uh, this gap of um, lack of bilingual, back bicultural licensed uh, uh, professionals. Marissa, I, I really want to, I don't know if there's any other questions out there, but I, I really want to thank the Institute. I mean, it's been a, just a sure pleasure. Uh, my coming to the Cleveland, Cuyahoga County almost eight years ago uh, and coming in as a prevention specialist, uh, my first inclination was to find out what is happening with our youth. And uh, it was your, it was the, the Prevention Research Institute that really uh, I, I married myself to it because they were the ones that were really giving me information on just what is happening with our youth. And um, you have been most supportive uh, with Hispanic Humidop uh, and, and other organizations uh, that, that serve our community. But um, I'm very grateful that you are continuing to bring focus this mental health issues for Latino uh, youth and, and, and adolescents. And, and this important topic for our community. Uh, we are a community that is built around the family mm -hmm. and that family is built upon abuela and mommy, okay? And if our abuelas and our mommies and our girls are right now struggling, okay? Which is the backbone of our households, mm -hmm. then the future of, of the Hispanic community does not stand well. And that's why I'm most concerned about this because this depressive symptoms is occurring in our girls, which is the, which is fundamentally the bedrock and foundation of our Latina families, are our women. And uh, so we need to really get get a hold of this and and provide the necessary services so that we could continue to have strong uh, Latinas who will then translate that to strong families, and then we can translate that to strong communities. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. We have uh, more work to do, more collaborating. And I also want to add a, a, a small piece. We need also to ensure that we advocate in the communities also for sports, also for activities that we know that the children enjoy. There are some areas that unfortunately these children and youths does not have a safe space to practice sports, to practice activities that they um, like. Because remember, now I'm coming from a country, from whatever you are coming from, with friends playing basketball, baseball, soccer, whatever, you name it. And now I'm coming to be in a house um, where it's most of the times it's cold. Um, listening to everything because when you are in your country, so they send you to the backyard and you barely listen to something sometimes. But I think advocating also for programming and also for safe space in the communities for these children to look to um, when they need to cope, like those safe spaces where I can go if I'm having issues with in my house. So I know Esperanza is there. I know I can go there and I can talk to something. So, so keep advocating for those um, safe spaces for our youths and children. Thank you. And thank you for this wonderful presentation and to panelists for all of your insights. Um, thank you to everyone who's attended this session today. Our next seminar series is going to be on May 12th with a presentation by Dr. Scott Moore and Dr. Dana Prince. Thank you and hope everyone has a great day. Good Thank afternoon. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.